Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Perth Fortress this morning. It's great to see you all here. It's, uh, it's great that we share together. It's great that we have people sharing with us from around Australia and around the world. And we celebrate that opportunity that we have this morning. We also celebrate the fact that we can have people joining with us this morning who are celebrating their 80th birthday coming up soon. So Val and Noel, I understand, Noel's hiding at the back there, not listening. It's okay, Noel, I understand that you and Val have got 80th birthdays coming up. So we congratulate you on that. Thank you. And as we've announced over the last few weeks, we do have full capacity here within the hall for the whole congregation. So we understand some people are still choosing to worship at home using the Th thinking of their own safety, their own health at this time, and we understand that. We understand people are on holiday at this time as well. But just so that you are aware that we do have full capacity again, the going to phase five in WA has no impact on our capacity in the building for our normal full congregation. Now, this week we've had a, a couple of families who have had health issues in particular, and this isn't all the health issues that we have in the core, because I don't have long enough for that. We are an older generation, some of us. Uh, but especially, I would like to ask that you can consider in your prayers Bill and Mary, Bill and Mary Gemmel. This week, Bill's had an operation, and th the family w would truly treasure having our support, having our prayers and support at this time. And also with Greg and Susan Broad, where Greg's in hospital and just transferred to Sir Charles Gardner. So please, in your prayers and your personal devotion time this week, remember both those families. Uh, as we've done in previous weeks, our, as we go through our tithes and offering later in the meeting, we will ask you to come forward with those so that we're not passing plates around. And for those who are at home, we, we still have the ability, as we always have, for the electronic giving through your banking, and we'd encourage you to do that. It's part of the support of our worship here, of our operation, and of our outreach that we have in our communities. We would ask that uh, during the holiday time just now that you follow the instructions from your section leaders. There are some practices on, some are changing a little bit, so please follow their lead. They'll tell you when you're meant to be here practicing and doing your home practice, so please uh, take note from that. And now I'll hand over to Major Deb this morning, thank you, who's walking and not limping. We're not talking about your bad back, it's much better. It's great to see you moving, Deb. Good to have you back, Paul. Hello, everybody. It's, I'm, I just said to Alwyn, there's more people in the room this morning, and it's lovely to see more and more people joining us in the room. And welcome to you two online. It's lovely to have you checking in with us today. You know, as we come together and as we gather to worship this morning, we have the, a wonderful privilege to join our voices with the heavenly voices as we declare this morning the song that's been introduced to us. God's love is wonderful. And so I thought, what a better, no better way to start our meeting than to gather together as a community of faith and to declare publicly, God's love to me is wonderful. You know, the words in these verses say um, that he should deign to hear the faintest whisper of my heart Wipe from my eyes the tear, and though I cannot comprehend such love, so great, so deep, in his strong hands my soul I trust, he will not fail to keep. Amen. It goes on to say, my very steps are planned. When mists of doubt encompass me, I hold my Father's hand. And in the last verse says, God's love to me is wonderful. He lights the darkest way. I now enjoy his fellowship to last through endless day. And he doesn't ask that we bring great gifts to him, but only that we love him too and serve him here below. Great words. God's love to us is wonderful. So let's stand together wherever you are in the room or online. Let's sing together straight through. God's love is wonderful. <laughs>
to come and read to us from our psalm, Psalm 119. And then following Jill reading from the psalms, uh, the team will come and lead us in some worship. Amen. Good morning, everyone. The reading this morning is taken from Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decree to the very end. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to stand. And to join us as we sing, there are many, many reasons why we have to be here happy worshipping our Lord. But this song talks about having 10,000 reasons and more. I can't imagine trying to work out 10,000 things in my head. I can't remember two or three. But 10,000 reasons and there are more still for our reason to be worshipping and blessing our Lord. Please join us as we sing this together.
top of that, we've got those 10,000 and more reasons. We have to have our eyes open to what the Lord wants us to do and to be used by Him. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let me see what you would have me do for you in my life. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. team, please take your seats as we enter a time of prayer together this morning. I'm going to read from our gospel reading from Matthew chapter 13. And as we've sung, may the Lord open the eyes of our hearts as we hear from his word this morning and as we enter into a time of prayer. Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 to 9 to commence with. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then down to verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. 
The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. We're going to read together a responsive prayer based on this reading this morning. It's a prayers of, it's prayers of the people. We're going to pray for our world and our leaders and our core. And there's a little refrain that says, may your love be like a seed taking root and growing strong. And I invite you in the room or online to read that refrain with me. May your love be like a seed taking root and growing strong. And friends, as we pray, would you just bring our, bring our hearts and our thoughts of those that are in our minds that need our prayers, whether it be people in our core. Um, I think of the state of Victoria, um, our world in the crisis. Let's just come intentionally as we pray the prayers of the people this morning. For all the blessings of this life, we give thanks to you, Creator God. For families, friends, colleagues, neighbours and strangers who nurture us, that the love of God may grow within. That your love, your word, like a seed, may grow to produce in us good fruit. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For the leaders of various nations and cities, that they may lead with strong hearts and gentle hands and generous spirits, with compassion and mercy, with wisdom and grace. May they reflect your will, guiding all their actions and decisions. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who serve in harm's way, those who live in dangerous places, those who live in areas of war and strife, those who live in fear, those who worry about employment, bills, food, and struggle just to find dignity in life, May your grace bring peace and safety to all people, one to another. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who suffer from any illness or disease, of mind, body or spirit, restore these and all those we carry in our hearts to fullness of health. Health as only you, O oh God, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing, mercy and love. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who are dying and for those who have died, send forth your comforting love. Give solace to those who mourn. Console those who grieve. May your grace surround us like a mantle upon our heads, a shawl upon our shoulders, a hand to hold our hand. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord with our tithes and offering as we come under the ministry of the piano and organ this morning and the songsters will form in preparation for their message.
The next Bible reading is from Genesis 25, verse 19 to 34. Genesis 25, verse 19 to 34. Jacob and Esau. This is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram and his sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his, his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jotted each other within her and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire to the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One pe people will be stronger than the other. The older will save the younger. When the time came to her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they called him Esau. After his brother came out, within his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was called Jacob. Jacob was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The two boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who, who had a taste of wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished, he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of the Jacob, the red stew, sorry. Quick, let me come and have the red stew. I'm furnished. That is why he was called Edom. 
Jacob replied, first tell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on oath to sell his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Amen. Thank you, Ben, for your ministry this morning. You know, several years ago, I had the privilege uh, of sitting under the teaching uh, of John Gowans, former General of the Salvation Army, promoted to glory in 2012. But at that time, he was the territorial commander of the then Australia Eastern Territory, and I was a cadet in training to be an officer. And there were quite a few occasions where he would come to us and speak to us cadets, and I fondly remember them being powerful times that impacted my life in God. On one of those occasions, uh, John Gowan spoke uh, about how we can cooperate with God in fulfilling God's plan of redemption in the world. It was really an encouraging, a very inspiring, inspiring time, very powerful. 
What also stuck out from, particularly from that message that he gave us that day, was that John Gowan said, we, you and I, can also frustrate God's plan. And I remember that word just stuck out. Frustrate God. How can I frustrate God? I can understand that I can disappoint him. Uh, I can hurt him. But to frustrate him, that was new thinking, at least for me. Maybe it's not for you, but it was for me. And what I want to explore this morning, from our story in Genesis, we have the story of Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob, because Esau was born first, wasn't he? From Genesis 25, is something about this idea of frustration. So let's take a, a closer look and have a little journey in this story, uh, what we see here. Firstly, we have Jacob and Esau's parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Now, Rebekah, like her mother-in-law, Sarah, was childless. Isaac and Rebekah had been hoping to have children and they knew of God's promise to Abraham to be the father of many nations. Yet, even though uh, Isaac himself had a miraculous birth and God had divinely directed Abraham's servant to choose Rebekah as the wife of, of Isaac, they had gone 20 years without conceiving. The childless couple didn't take matters into their own hands like Jacob's parents had done, but tr entrusted their future into the care of Yahweh. And Isaac's response was prayer. Notice, that's good. He prays because he knows God has the power and the resources to open the womb of his barren wife. And after all, he himself is living proof of God's power to do that and bring life into the existence in the midst of barrenness. He prays and Yahweh responds. Rebecca is soon pregnant, not just with one baby, but with twins. Anyone who had twins in the room knows the dilemma that that brings. And the miracle of pregnancy doesn't bring joy to the expectant mother. Something seemed wrong with her that she sensed with the pregnancy. And scripture tells us that they jostled in each other inside the womb. So much so that God, uh, Rebecca goes to God and asks, what's going on here? In verse 23, we hear her, uh, what the Lord told, tells her. Two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within will, you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. We're actually not given uh, details uh, that uh, this actually offered any comfort to Rebecca, but we can imagine that she was amazed at the prospect of giving birth to twins. Maybe this was the first time she heard that. And then to hear uh, they would be the fathers of, of, of great nations probably came as a shock. Plus, you would expect being told that uh, they would always be at odds with each other would also probably sadden the mother's heart. So, uh, Esau was born, born first. It says he's red and hairy. Uh, his, his, his name is a play on the word hairy. It sounded like the Hebrew word for hairy. And then Jacob uh, was quick to follow, holding on to Esau's heel. His name was also a play on the Hebrew word that, was, that means someone to grab or trip up someone's heel and hang on and tripping them up. The twins weren't identical. In fact, they were actually quite different. Esau grew up to be a skilled hunter. He liked the outdoors, away from home, demonstrating his skill and strength. It makes me think of uh, that... Uh, uh, what, um, what's the adventure guy who jumps out of helicopters and goes into the bush? Bear Grylls. It makes me think of him. <laughs> That was Esau, whereas Jacob was a bit of a homebody, living in, among his community, liking, uh, likely, he was likely to be a shepherd nearby, and he was involved in the affairs of the home. If you like a play on words, you could probably call Esau was the wild man and Jacob was the mild man. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's some humour there somewhere. Scripture tells us that their father Isaac had a taste for wild game, so he favoured Esau because he would bring him meat. Man wants meat. While their mother Rebecca loved, uh, favoured Jacob, perhaps because he was helpful around the home. And then we read in the story, these guys, uh, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, it says, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of the red stew, I'm famished. And Jacob replied first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on earth, selling his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob saw, uh, gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank. He got up and left. And he despised his birthright, it says. Now, as the son, 
who was born first, even if it was just a little while before him, Esau had the birthright, meaning he would inherit the double portion of his father's estate. And as the firstborn, Esau would have, been, have understood that as the heir, he was the heir to the covenantal promise that God had given to his grandfather Abraham and extended to his father Isaac. Yet Esau takes the double portion of his father's estate and the promise that it entailed and trades it in for a bowl of red stew. And we don't really see how Esau could have been so short-sighted that is to focus on the immediate desires of his flesh instead of the promises of God for his life. From our viewpoint, we might shake our heads in dismay at the way he despised his birthright and at the promise of God for a bowl of red stew. Now, how good was this stew? <laughs> it must have been good. Was Jacob such a master chef that this stew was something to die for? You know? The red stew, it says, was lentil soup. I know I can enjoy a lentil soup, but it's not something to die for. So Esau was famished. That's what we understand. He was so hungry that he couldn't see past his stomach. He was all about the convenience and to have it now. So much so he was willing to trade all that the, the, the promise that was on his life for a bowl of lentil soup. Yet before we throw stones at him, I wonder how many times have we traded in God's promises for a bowl of red stew? Have we ever chosen a convenience over a greater purpose? Perhaps when we've copped out on doing the right thing because it would be easier to avoid the issue, we have traded God's promise for a bowl of red stew. Perhaps when we've, been short, when we've shortchanged God of our time, of our talents, of our treasures, we have traded God's promises for a bowl of red stew. Perhaps when we've looked for a way out of God's will rather than the way in, we have traded God's promises for a bowl of red stew. And I'll let that answer be between, be between you and God. Such was the man named Esau. But we must, best not forget the other son here, the man named Jacob. If Jacob was really a caring brother, he would have offered the stew to Esau. <laughs> but no, Jacob was not caring, he was conniving. He takes advantage of his brother in need. Jacob was not so much a master chef, but a master manipulator. He perceived his brother Esau was too exhausted to value something as abstract as a birthright over tangible fresh food in that moment. And the skill with which Jacob handled the situation suggests he was looking for this opportunity. Jacob, as his name implied, grabbing at the heel and tripping someone up, was determined devious and deceptive. Interestingly here, there was no immediate censure of Jacob's actions, but he did spend many anxious years, if you know his story, after this regretting what he had done. The twin brothers reveal here and in the narratives that follow two con contrasting ways of life, neither of which is commendable, nor in alignment with God's work in the world. The intent of the narrator is to challenge us, the listener, to reflect on the alternative to the Esau and the Jacob way of life. The story of their lives unfolds in the succeeding chapters and we'll be, we're going to return to um, them in coming weeks. Stay tuned. It does not contain... Uh, it contains much more to see and, the wonder, and wonderfully, thankfully, Jacob's life-transforming uh, encounter with God and a heartwarming reunion with his, with his estranged brother. But for today and for now, we want to learn from this passage of Esau and Jacob. God had a plan that we see through Abraham's lineage was setting up a future promise, one that was of, of people who were his own, a line of hope and of promise, which we, on this side of Calvary, can see that it was the line of the Saviour, Christ Jesus, God's plan of salvation for the world, the greatest plan of all. First it was Abraham, then Isaac, and then in God's plan it was Jacob. Yet we don't find Jacob as a holy man, living in submission and righteousness before a holy God. He is a master manipulator seeking his own future. Amid all this difficulty, what will become of the promises of God? Will they transpire as God intends? The promises of God may not, be give, uh, may, may not give a precise shape to the future, but God will be faithful that 
will never be in doubt. However, what the recipients of the promise do and say along the way will make a difference regarding the shape of the fulfilment. Did Jacob mess up God's plan? Well, no. Did God like the way Jacob lived? Well, no. Lessons to learn. We cannot stop the will of God. His way is invincible. His kingdom reigns. And nothing and no one can thwart the kingdom of God. But we can frustrate it by our selfishness and our pride and our sin. And how God's plan takes shape can be frustrated and complicated by the likes of us. Yet, into all that, by God's grace, he doesn't abandon us nor dismiss us, but invites us to grow more and more in harmony with him and his plan and even find life to be fulfilling and satisfying. Man's will is selfish, messy, and can have long-term dire consequences. Yet somehow God's will and man's will are intertwined. Such is the grace of God to have the likes of us, messy, selfish people, be the instruments of his divine will. He doesn't force us, he invites us into his plan. So where are we in the narrative of God's will and redemptive plan today? Are we in harmony or are we a frustration? One of the lectionary readings that we haven't used today in our worship meeting is uh, from Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans 8, 1 to 11 is part of the lectionary readings for today. This reading includes the words from the Apostle Paul, uh, verses 5 and 6. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. You see, for Paul, the issue is one of control. Do we live a life which we control, or have we turned over to his control? He will never force that control on us, so we're invited to surrender our control and yield ourselves into the hands of God. Are we living according to the Spirit, or have we traded that in for a bowl of red stew? Do we think that we know what's best, or are we willing to recognise that the Lord knows what's best for our lives? We're going to spend a few moments just reflecting on that, and I invite the team to come and prepare to lead us in a song. And it's a song that's a prayer. It's a simple song asking God to reveal to us his ways to help us live in submission to the Spirit, to help us live in harmony with his divine will. But as we prepare for that moment, I want to read um, a little poem that was written by John Gowans, the man I mentioned earlier at the start. He was a skilled poet too, and a lyricist, and the army published quite a few of his short poems. Um, you may have seen this book before. Uh, there's a few copies of this around. And in this I found it uh, through the week, I was looking at it, and I found one that's called Oddities. And it relates to how God, by his grace, uh, chooses to use the likes of us as participants and partners in his divine plan of salvation. So before we sing this song as a time of reflection, let me share some words written by John Gowans called Oddities. You let some funny people work for you, and your disciples are a motley crew, the limited, the damaged and the lame do one daily wonders in your holy name. They're far from perfect, you don't seem to mind. They're far from worthy and you're far too kind. You still prefer, I note with glad surprise, to use the weak things to confound the wise. Let's sing and let this be a prayer and response of our hearts, a prayer that we seek him to show us his ways and walk in his ways. Show me your ways that I may walk with you. 
Show me your ways. I put my hope in you. The cry of my heart is to love you more, to live with the touch of your hand stronger each day. to join me and bow before our God in prayer. Father God, we worship you for you are the only one and only God. You are sovereign, you are holy, nothing and no one is greater than you and nothing and no one can stop your will. We confess we all too often seek our own will and frustrate your plan. So we seek your forgiveness. We want to be your people, following you and living in harmony with your will. So thank you for your grace that invites us to know you. And thank you for your grace that encourages us to grow more and more in tune with your spirit and to live life in fulfillment in you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us, to show us your ways that we may walk with you. We pray in the name of the Christ, through the Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm actually going home to make some stew. <laughs> But I promise not to settle for it in my life this week. It's a good word. Let's not settle for red stew or lentil soup. Well, we started off our meeting as we gathered together singing God's love to us is wonderful. And we declared it and we joined the heavenlies. And we're going to finish the same this morning. Song 56, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. As we started, we finished lifting up our prayers of praise to him. All ye who hear, brothers and sisters, draw near. Praise him with glad adoration. We're going to sing verses 1, 4 and 5. Let's stand together as we sing our closing song. <laughs>
out into this week a blessing to those in the room and online with us today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you.